I my um my friend and business mentor, we uh I, I basically say he's like the sixty year old version of me. Um <laughs> although he doesn't look it because he he runs, he takes care of himself. And uh, you know, he says, Yeah, none of it matters. So you are the one that gets to imbue meaning on it. It puts a lot of it puts the onus on you and a lot of responsibility on your shoulders, which can be crushing, but it can also be freeing in the sense that, yeah, none of it matters. Like I don't have any external validation to meet. It's all up to me to decide what's important. I think Megan, you were kind of touching on that earlier, basically that, that internal locus of control where you're like, I control the things you know that matter to me. And, and I do things that are you know internally motivated instead of, you know, I want to have a gold medal or a beaver trophy or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think that point is really interesting. And I've actually noticed that for myself. Um, and then athletes that I work with who might be more driven or maybe prone to or towards anxiety, that thinking about that and coming at that with the lens of like, oh, maybe these little things don't matter as much is what gives them the meaning to like go and take failures and take risks. And so it's almost like that it's kind of like that gateway that you can get to really putting yourself out there and getting to that place of like, oh my gosh, I want to do everything sort of situation. Yeah, totally agree. I mean, I think it's the most empowering thought process you can have. And the reason we try to talk about it all the time is like, if you have that, that understanding of the impermanence of things, you can also give yourself the grace to just be, I'm freaking awesome the way I am right now. Like no matter what that means. And from there, you can then take risks. You can fail. You can, you can strive. You can do all these things without having it impact that, like that core value, that core thing of like, you know, finding the goodness in things and, and all that. So, yeah, I mean, like it's almost a cop out in some ways because like all this stuff is way more complicated, but for us, like, essentially what we say to athletes and like in the previous e- in the previous email that in our previous email ended up becoming the book was your stardust with delusions of grandeur have that give you the strength and the the power to like you know put yourself out there and not worry too much about what comes of it. Mm-hmm. Well, I, and I, I think it seemed like almost constantly through the book you kind of almost try to redress yourself in terms of like saying, okay, I know this sounds really woo woo, but. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so you have, have like, have you dealt with any, any kind of, I guess I'll say backlash. That's a little dramatic, but you know what I mean? Like a backlash for that kind of approach instead of like being super scientific and everything's quantitative and we are going to measure absolutely everything, you know, have you gotten any, like, I guess haters or negative feedback for that? Yeah, we've definitely had our share of haters. I think actually, I, honestly, like if you put yourself out there, I think anyone's going to have yeah. haters. There's like a percentage out there, like 10% of the people in the world are going to hate you no matter what. Right. You do. I think, I think and then like the more that you build your following, the more that 10% becomes in terms right. of a pure whole number. So um, we've definitely had our fair share of haters. It's actually been interesting. I don't look at Amazon reviews. David does. Um, and so, I try to stay away from them. I try to stay away from them anymore for like any of the products I bring out. Like I'll look at them every once in a while, but it's so much easier to focus on the negative one and be like why don't they like it like i want them to like it (laughs) well it's so interesting like i mean it gets to everything like so that being a good example of you know someone being like oh it changes my life and then one person being like this is the worst book i've ever read and it's the same book right and um you know that gets back to everything i think in life like if you had amazon reviews on us as people, it would look the same way where it's like, hopefully we'd have 90% five stars, but there would <laughs> definitely be some one stars. And, <laughs> you know, I think that all, we all die thing also comes with that, that turnaround, which is like, you know, you're not going to be on the same page as everyone else. And that's okay. Like, um, I like what, what Pete Holmes says about stuff, like the comedian Pete Holmes says about stuff that like a movie he doesn't like or whatever. He says, it's just not for me. And I, I accept that I am not for other people too. Like we're not for other people. And, um, you know, just because someone doesn't share our approach, that doesn't mean they're wrong at all. Um, it just means that, you know, we might not be getting a drink at the bar. Well, I think when we sat down to write that book, our number one goal was to stay authentic to who we are. Mm-hmm. So we were only going to publish a book that we felt like was in our voices, was authentic to who we are. And it made it actually a lot easier to write the book because it was like when we were editing, it was like, is this us? Is this authentic? And um, as a result, like it was just really fun to put out there. But it's I would wonder actually like, 
if you would have a higher percentage of haters, if you weren't authentic to yourself, you know, it's like, it's, I'm like fascinated by, I'm sure there's like statistics out there on that. I'm fascinated by that concept. Probably depends on who you are. That's true. That's very if true. You were, yeah. If you weren't authentic, probably worse. <laughs> if I wasn't authentic, probably better, actually. You know, this, there's almost, I've, I've had people that, um, and this isn't the entrepreneur community, but people that are almost like, um, you need to, do things like this particular has to do with the marketing messages. You need to do things so that people don't like you. Like <laughs> you need to make it polarized because if there are people that don't like you, there's going to be people that really like you. If you try to please everybody, you end up in this like weird, lukewarm. People are just like, yeah, they're okay. You don't, you know, <laughs> you don't want people to be like, the book was okay, right? Yeah. You want those like, that changed my life. And then other people just be like, that was the dumbest thing I've ever read. Like <laughs> you got to have that di divergence if you you know ha want to have those high ones. And yeah, I think that probably applies to our coaching too. Yeah. Like, you know, um, especially at first, I would say that there was a lot, there was a fair amount of pushback within like the community. And by, again, like the pushback there is being vocal. So you hear it more and you're just more mm -hmm. tuned to it because that's how our brains work. Um, but it's, I mean, I haven't heard anything recently and that's actually nice because I think, in general, like the the message we're trying to push is like it's not one of right or wrong. It's just one of like no matter what you think, you're right. So I think people are starting to get a little bit more accepting of that, at least in our little edge of the world. Because we're not trying to say that someone that disagrees with us is wrong. We're just trying to say like, you know, this is what works for some of the people we are around and know. Like it's definitely not for everyone. I mean, we'll ask like before we coach someone, we ask like a million questions trying to get at that. Like, is this for them? Um, and so yeah, that's kind of where we're coming from. It almost seems like um I've kind of ascribed to this philosophy, I think for longer than college, but I, it came to a point where I could actually um describe it as essentially utilitarianism, like the the harm principle, like you do your thing. If you're not harming anybody else, like whatever, you know, no big <laughs> deal. It's okay. I, I kind of, I think you guys probably are taking a kind of similar approach. Like this works for us. This works for a lot of people we know. We also know it's not going to work for everybody and that's fine. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, whether it's John Stuart Mill or Kant or like Buddha, right, it was, or, yeah, it was, it you was know, Mill we got into in, or in Tim college, yeah. or whatever, like, I mean, everyone's kind of saying the same things, I think, at the end of the day, you know, like, um, just with different packaging. Yeah. Um, and the packaging that we wanted to adopt, you know, on like, again, we have no new ideas. It's just essentially like, you are loved. Like, you, where you are right now, you are so loved. And so, you know, just take that and apply it to athletics as much as possible. Um, since that that might be a place where it doesn't always apply because you do have times, you do have pro cards, you do have, um, you know, aging and all these other things. So um, we're just like, yeah, you're you're always loved. And like as a community, we hopefully can like build that up more and more over time. And then it just makes everything else seem a little less dark and scary. I think getting back to the hater thing that I just want to comment on real quickly is that like, even though we're so nonchalant about it and we make fun of like, you know, some of the haters that we do have or like the one star reviews, it still does hurt a little bit. And I think like, oh, yeah. yeah. And I think like that's a natural human emotion and we're like, we're totally fine with that. And like, I think the more practice you have, the less it hurts. It hurts for like two seconds as opposed to like a whole day. Um, but I think like, even though we're so nonchalant about it, like, you know, we're still human and it still hurts. Oh, she's more nonchalant than I am. <laughs> she's better at this than I am. I I'm the one that like, internalizes things and like still feels bad about a tweet someone sent three years ago or something so <laughs> yeah it's all it's all trying to trying to grow a little bit so I, I talk about this with some people um depending on you know kind of what our topics are but do you is the happy runner basically laying out what you believe the purpose of sport is I think it's, for me, it's laying out the purpose of sport for some individuals. Okay. So I think the philosophy, it kind of, this kind of gets back to the last discussion that we were having. I think the philosophy in the book is powerful for individuals who may be highly driven, who may struggle with anxiety, who um, are looking to like enjoy the process. I think the happy runner for building a world champion, Olympic level athlete may not be the best philosophy. I, would you agree with that, David? I think it depends. It depends. Uh, it depends. I think like, it's I, so dependent on the person. I mean, and I think it gets back to what you were saying before with your, you were saying drive runs in the family. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, that's so intuitive. So Megan, in addition to all the things she does is it works, she's doing a PhD in that overlaps with genetics and she's working in a genetic startup. And essentially the more we learn about genetics and I'm paraphrasing everything she's taught me here, we learn that so much of this, this stuff that seems like it's a choice, seems like it's character and all these other things is something that's semi-programmed and we can change a little, but you know, the athletics is the same way. So I would disagree slightly on that for the first time ever. And just say that I had a feeling I saw your face and I was like, I should probably check in with you on this one. (laughs) Well, that the marble finds its groove or whatever, you know, where those types of athletes are like, it's because of the parents that they have. And from there, yeah, you add things on top of that, whether that's like an obsessive drive or, you know, in unfortunate cases, doping and and things like that. But um, yeah, I mean, I would just say that like, that same reasoning applies to all of us. So, you know, you strive, but strive with the understanding that it's not a question of how hard you work. It's not like a race isn't being like, who this is, person is the toughest of all. Like the, It's like, no, a lot of this is out of your control. Um, and so I would say that that is kind of a philosophy on sport generally too, which is a lot of this is out of your control. And with that context, like make sure you love every day, make sure, or by love, not necessarily enjoy, but it it's something that, you know, you would you're doing not because of external validation um and from there yeah then you can bring the you know bring lift everyone up and things like that um so yeah i mean that that basically like the message of the book i would say is cut yourself and cut others so much slack and you know from there then you can open up the door to like loving others and things like that i i um i'm trying to remember so before we got going, before the recording got going, we were talking about uh, Mike Hagedon, who, who I'd had on a previous episode, is who said I should speak with you guys. And I feel like I spoke with Mike about this, but I, I could be wrong because I think I've spoken to several people who are in, into ultras. And I almost – you guys may have some insights into this um, from the people you work with. I almost feel like you know, we could probably learn more from the people – that are the last people finishing an ultra versus the people that win the ultras. Cause you know, I, I think I said at that time, whatever interview it was when they start there, I would say 90% of the time they know they're not going to win. Like they're not out there to win. And there's some kind of deeper insight they have about why they're out there and what's driving them besides I want to be on the podium. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, when you start to delve down into that, um, it becomes a complex question. I mean, I would, I would say that, you know, from like what we try to say to everyone is that you're all and everyone is an elite athlete, as long as you're pursuing your potential in the context of a life that's meaningful to you. Like, so that's our caveat. And within that framework, we find that everyone pretty much gives what they have and goes through similar things. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe some of the motivations are different, but like, we're trying to push everyone to be the same motivation, which is like, you know, you're, you're exploring meaning as it relates to you on that day, trying to make stories, trying to laugh at yourself and learn from failure and all those other things. Um, so yeah, we try not to differentiate too much based on like whether someone's at the front or the back or whatever. Um, because we're trying to say, you know, it only matters insofar as like our marketing or whatever, (laughs) or like their personal brand. It doesn't matter Mm -hmm. as so like, how you feel about yourself or what the experience feels like. Yeah, their experiences are almost nearly the same. It's like everyone gets equally nervous before races. Like everyone struggles to sleep the night of races. Like everyone has these like major um, like existential crises and self crises of self. And it's like, we all go through the same things, whether you're like the very front of the race or back of the race. And like, honestly, the goal setting is pretty similar too. Yeah. Um, so I think as coaches, that has been really interesting. And as coaches, we actually really prioritize taking on a diverse group of athletes. So we coach some very top athletes and then we coach athletes too, who are just starting out in the sport. And I feel like we learn equally from all of those athletes and, and that's been a fun process for us. So I think that kind of, it almost begs the question, that and I think it makes perfect sense that, that we all kind of go through similar struggles. And at times I think the, I'll say the elite uh, runners often get almost shrouded in mystique where like they're superhumans and they, you know, they can do things that the rest of us can't. But I think you guys 
no, even though you're, you know, obviously ascribing a different message and trying to promote a different message that often culturally we focus on the winners. Those are the people that are important to pay attention to. Why do you think we focus on those winners as a, as a culture? Oh, I mean, that's just, it, you know, it's, it's all about the stories that are being told. And so the winners or whatever, I mean, there is that competitive aspect where it's like, like sports games, you know, you or like basketball or whatever, you're playing to see who scores the most points. Like, mm-hmm. you know, obviously the Bucks, the Milwaukee Bucks, it is a meaningless, uh, you know, definition. Like, <laughs> why Milwaukee? Why the Bucks? You know what I mean? But we're still like, it's this story that's fun to follow, fun to root for, interesting. And I think running's the same way. It's interesting. It's fun to the people that are following it. It, it gives these narratives that add meaning to their lives and are interesting to follow. And so it's like a fan thing. But I think what we saw pretty early on is, you know, like we're fortunate to see the lives of some of these people shot in a mystique behind the scenes. And, you know, they're going through everything you can imagine. And that that fanhood or or that support they have really doesn't add anything, like unless it's true and personal, like it doesn't it just adds pressure. It doesn't necessarily add joy and meaning and self-love. And so that's why we're just focusing on self-love. And so that those stories from the front front of the pack, I think they're awesome. Because it is like, you know, it's fun. It's it's really fun to follow. I'm I'm a fan of Claire Gallagher for the same reason that I like watching basketball, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think when you're talking about the individual person, whether it's, you know, Giannis Antetokounmpo or Claire, it's like their happiness and the Bucks or Claire's performance, like whatever, you know. Um, so that's kind of where I think my impression too is that trail running is kind of bucking that tide a little bit so I think in trail running it's like it's still a pretty small bean sport in terms of like NBA basketball like no one's no one's on a million dollar contract in trail running like let's be right right. um and I think as a result like it is more story centric and I think it's more story centric across the board and I think that people who are creative people who are engaging people who are involved in the community have these amazing voices that add to it and, you know, we've seen, I've worked with some like diverse runners who have really like brought in the diversity into the community and made that a story. And um, it's a beautiful thing. And so I think, I think that's the power of trail running. And I think like inherent in that is just the fact that we're all like trudging through woods and mountains. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's hard to take yourself seriously when you're doing that in the process. Definitely. Yeah. 